Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. One of the biggest arguments that is put forward by people that don't agree with the timeline of Egypt's old kingdom is the decline in the quality of the pyramid structure. The Egyptological argument starts well, with the pyramid evolving from a mound to a mastaba to a step pyramid, to a failed smooth-sided pyramid to the bent pyramid, to the first true pyramid, to the pinnacle of pyramid building with the Great Pyramid. Wow, I said pyramid a lot in that sentence. This step-by-step -step evolution in pyramid building does make sense, but many people ask, why does pyramid building get worse and worse from then on? If pyramids are tombs, surely kings wanted to outdo those that came before them. Why is Khafre's pyramid smaller than Khufu's? Why is Menkore smaller than Khafre's? Why do pyramids end up as crumbled mud brick structures in later dynasties? They are all valid questions and often go unaddressed. So, in this video, although this is a debated subject like everything is, and although material and written records are not the best, I'm going to present one possible explanation. Why did no pharaoh surpass the architectural achievements of King Khufu? Ever since my recent documentary, where I attempt to solve the mystery of the Great Pyramid, I have to say that Khufu does give the Great Pyramid and Old Kingdom Egyptian history context. And, in this video, you'll see exactly what I mean. People often forget that life in historic times was not as simple as we often make out. Pyramid building, creating a magnificent structure to transport the soul to the afterlife to live with the gods, was no cheap or easy process. It required funds, labour and materials, a project that needed to be balanced with ensuring the country continued to prosper, that it was protected from foreign threats, as well as forces from within. The people also needed to be looked after, to be fed and watered, because power and control can easily be lost if the country is plunged into chaos. By all accounts, after the reign of 4th dynasty King Khufu, Egypt underwent some fundamental changes, certainly concerning religion, which could have led to the onset of internal power struggles. Following his reign, we begin to see the decentralisation of power, with the growing status of the priesthood. This was seen most explicitly in the 5th dynasty, as the king's power began to erode faster than the Sphinx enclosure. Yep, that's an Egyptian geology joke. And I'm sorry, please don't unsubscribe. Pyramids are thought to be a reflection of the Benben, -ben, the sacred stone of Heliopolis, a kind of homage to the primordial mound on which the first rays of the sun fell. It was the prototype of later obelisks and pyramids, especially their capstones. Egyptologists believe that pyramids were in fact solar symbols, and their size put them closer to the heavens. With regards to pyramid building, the 4th dynasty was obviously the golden era, and Snefru and Khufu were certainly in a league of their own. But then things began to change. Khafre's pyramid, although huge and impressive, was smaller, and it had a basic internal structure, and the stonework is also not as good. His son Menkore's pyramid is even smaller. Jedefre's pyramid at Abu Ruwash, if it was a pyramid, is thought to be a similar size to Menkore's. Now, the key thing I've noticed here is the names of the 4th dynasty kings. Snefru, Khufu, but then Jedefre, Khafre and Menkore. As you can see, the end of the names of Khufu's children and grandchild end in Ra or Re, the sun god. And I believe that this could be a critical point in our study of the 4th dynasty, because it marks the growing importance of the cult of the sun god to royalty and also the nobility. It is thought that less effort was devoted to the construction of pyramid complexes, because there were also other religious priorities. And this was all to do with appeasing the sun god, which was most blatantly seen in the 5th dynasty, with kings devoting large workforces to sun temples as well as pyramids. 
the king had two construction priorities, not one. It wasn't just about ensuring he was reborn in the afterlife, but the king had to appease the sun god in life as well, which also meant appeasing the priesthood of the god, through power and through money, and the latter could have affected the splendour of their pyramid structures. Khufu's son and successor, Jedefre, was the first king who introduced the royal title Sare, meaning Son of Ra, and was the first to connect his cartouche with the sun god. This is something that continued with Khafre, Menkore, and so on. We can see that Ra or Re were incorporated into their names. When this gnomon was first introduced, the sun and goose signs were placed at the end of the cartouche containing the name of the king. So it read, King of Lower and Upper Egypt, and then Son of Ra. Later, it was placed before the cartouche to show Ra's growing prominence, and it was also placed inside the cartouche. The rise of the Court of Ra is a turning point in Old Kingdom history, and under the reign of Jedefere, it certainly reached a new peak. Ra was now formerly the greatest of all gods, and pharaohs now believed they were the actual sons of Ra. This all began with Jedefere. In the reign of Khufu, although Ra's importance did grow, as seen by giant pyramids that may have been symbolic of the sun, Khufu was viewed as a living embodiment of Horus. But this wasn't how future kings were viewed. The general consensus is that Jedefere built his pyramid at Abu Ruash because from that location you could see the sun rising directly over the sun temple of Ra at Heliopolis during the summer solstice, the birthday of Ra. His pyramid is thought to have been small because of his age when he took the throne, not wanting to risk a lengthy construction, yet being built on higher ground at Abu Ruash meant that it would have that effect of splendour and magnificence, and it was also closer to Heliopolis. Jedefre's association with Ra meant that it was also likely that at the start of his reign, the priests of Heliopolis and hence the court of Ra grew in power. And so, this is likely the first sign of the decentralisation of power and wealth in the Old Kingdom. And less power and less wealth may well make for a smaller pyramid. His brother and successor, Khafre, chose to have his pyramid complex next to his father's at Giza. But its specific position on the Giza Plateau also seems to be influenced by Heliopolis. Let me explain. The Great Pyramid was first to be built and can be seen as a monumental marker for the setting sun from Heliopolis at certain times of the year during the Old Kingdom. And from the Great Pyramid, the Ben Ben Stone of Heliopolis marked the rising sun. This is recorded in various historical journals, but I do need to check when in the year this happened. The Giza Pyramids were visible from Heliopolis and vice versa. This may indicate that the court of Ra was important in the life of Khufu, but after his death, it appears that Jedefere took it to the next level. Khafre built his pyramid to line up with Khufu's so that both lined up with the sun temple of Heliopolis. Khafre also exploited the higher ground so that his pyramid, although slightly smaller, was effectively taller than the Great Pyramid. Menkore continued the family alignment, but the smaller pyramid could well be indicative of the changes of the Old Kingdom, with the continuing rise of the Court of Ra, changes which really came to a head in the 5th Dynasty. Interestingly, although their pyramids were less spectacular, Khafre and Menkore are believed to have made their mortuary complexes more spectacular in other ways. The complexes were more elaborate with their design, look and style, being far more beautiful in appearance. Granite casing was even used on the lower portion of the Khafre Pyramid, and granite casing stones could have completely covered the Menkore Pyramid, which would have been a very difficult and expensive process. More elaborate statues are thought to have been created, and the complexes also had more ornate decoration. All of these changes are thought by some to be because of the changes in religion in Egypt. As stated, Khufu was seen as the earthly manifestation of the god Horus. Jedefere was seen as the son of Ra, which can only be described as a royal religious reformation. 
he may have only reigned for 10 to 14 years, and when his brother Khafre took the throne, as earlier kings had done, Khafre associated himself with Horus. Yet he still included Ra within his name, and Ra was still recognised as the supreme god of Egypt. It seems that Ra's prominence was now established. Khafre didn't go back to the times of Khufu, and he was not considered the earthly manifestation of Horus. He referred to himself as Son of Horus, associated with the god but not the living god. This shows a clear erosion of the king's power from Khufu to Khafre, from an all-powerful god-king to a king who was the son of a god. The power of interpreting the will of the gods was now split between the king and the Egyptian priesthood. Interestingly, Khafre would also be considered a son of Ra, and maybe this is also the origins of the Ra Horus composite god, known as Ra Harakti, which I'll come to shortly. I'm guessing the religious reforms that were made after Khufu's reign were somewhat irreversible, and this could well have been a somewhat turbulent time. It's possible that Khafre needed the support of the priesthood as much as the priests needed a king. Either way, it is clear that after Khufu, the king of Egypt was never quite as powerful again, and some believe their wealth and influence was reduced. This is why pyramids never surpassed the Great Pyramid in size and quality. It is also possible that now there were simply other priorities. The king's divine authority was further eroded in the 5th dynasty, where temples were constructed not as before for the worship of the king, but also for the celebration of the cult of Ra. Sun temples and pyramids were both major construction projects by the king. Egyptian sun temples as a term mostly designates the temples built by 6 to 7 kings of the 5th dynasty, making a reappearance a thousand years later under the pharaoh Akhenaten. He reigned in the 18th dynasty of the New Kingdom. The early sun temples were built at Abu Ghurab and Abu Sir, modelled after the earlier or primary sun temple of Heliopolis. Archaeologists have only uncovered two, that of Yusakath and Neasser, but many more did exist and are recorded in writing. Although mostly destroyed, at the sun temple of Neasser, you can see just how impressive this structure would have once been, likely containing a giant obelisk and open to the air to capture the rays of the sun. Sun temples are mentioned in primary sources from this period, and they were a great source of wealth and importance in ancient Egypt. Each pharaoh gave their sun temple a name, such as Fortress of Ra, the Field of Ra, the Favourite Place of Ra, the Offering Place of Ra, the Horizon of Ra, and so on. King Yusakaf of the 5th dynasty took the Cult of Ra to the next level, the next major reformation after Jadephrae's, and Yusakaf's sun temple was seen as the mortuary temple of the setting sun. Rites performed in the temple were concerned with Ra's creator function as well as his role as father of the king. Experts believe that the reduction in the size of the king's pyramid complex in the 5th dynasty and the growing size of the sun temple meant there was a concrete separation between the sun god and the king, more so than in preceding dynasties. But it was in the 4th dynasty, after Khufu, when these major changes began. It is possible that Jadefre did build a sun temple close to his pyramid, and it is also possible that the Sphinx and the Sphinx Temple were also part of a sun temple complex, possibly the first major sun temple complex outside of Heliopolis, either built by Khufu, Jadefre or Khafre. With the Sphinx looking out to the place of sunrise, and with various solar alignments observed in the Sphinx Temple, this does make sense. In the New Kingdom, the Sphinx was known as Horomachet, a monument dedicated to the composite god Ra Harakti, which is Ra and Horus combined, as mentioned previously. And before you say the Sphinx and the Sphinx Temple are older than the 4th Dynasty, in my part 2 of the Geology of the Sphinx, you'll see why in actual fact, this may not actually be correct. And furthermore, if like I said in my last video, and the dates of the Old Kingdom are actually out by 2 to 300 years, well, this could add further credit to the notion that the Sphinx is a 4th Dynasty construction. 
Either way, it could have been turned into a lion and recarved in the 4th dynasty. Right now, all I'm saying is that geologically, the Sphinx in its current form could be a 4th dynasty monument, and two unrelated independent geologists have contacted me in the past week to explain this. I should add that neither geologist has a professional association to Egyptology. They have just interpreted the geology of the Sphinx in a different way to Robert Schock, and one of them points out a fundamental fact with regards to the climatology in pre-dynastic Egypt. The Sphinx was a solar monument in the New Kingdom, and therefore, because it looks out due east to the rising sun, it could well have been an Old Kingdom solar monument as well, coinciding with the rise of the sun cult of Ra. Of course, the subject of the fall and decline in pyramid building is complex, and I am aware I'm making a YouTube video for a broad audience, and not writing an historical paper for peer review. In basic terms, and to sum up this video, Khufu was the last king who was viewed as the living embodiment of the god Horus, whilst Judefere, Khafre, and Menkore, and so on, were all viewed as sons of gods. The court of Ra and the role of the priesthood grew in prominence after Khufu, and it's possible that power and wealth became decentralised, and we can see that religion was also reformed. All these factors combined meant that pyramids could never reach the lofty heights of the Great Pyramid, as is seen in the archaeological record. This really is a simplified look at the subject, and as I said, this subject is debated. But I believe the changes implemented by Jedefre, with the rise of the Court of Ra and the growing importance of Heliopolis, may have led to sacrifices in power and wealth for future kings. There were also other priorities. Maybe these changes were necessary to keep a united nation, or maybe Jadefere simply had another motive. We just don't know. All we know for sure is that pyramid building reached its peak with Khufu, and nobody ever surpassed him again. And this is all possibly down to the rising importance of the cult of the sun god, Ra. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.